I'm here today with Professor Alex Hill, who is the co-founder and director of the Centre for High Performance. She's dedicated to helping high-performing organisations develop a stronger and more robust economy, society and environment. He's also a professor at Kingston University, educator at Duke Corporate Education and visiting professor at several international institutions. And more pertinently for this podcast, he is the author of Centennials, The Twelve Habits of Great enduring organisations. So first of all, welcome Alex and congratulations on the new book. Thank you, thank you very much for having me, lovely to see you, lovely to be here. Very good to have you here Um, and I particularly, let's just start with the title because it's a very resonant sort of august sounding title isn't it, Centennials. Tell us a little bit about where it came from and, and what your sort of thinking was about longevity and its relevance today. Yeah I mean I think the challenge of every researcher or writer, is that uh, your work is far more interesting to you than the reader. So how do you <laughs> engage the reader, you know? And uh, and also you find this um, because, you know, I obviously teach as well as research and write. So uh, often you present your ideas in a classroom and the things that you think are really fascinating and really interesting, just sort of, you know, the tumbleweed goes through. And then things which you just think are kind of almost like a throwaway comment, everyone seizes and grabs. And what you realise um, is sort of what gets played back to you. So when you have a cup of coffee, or particularly when you're sort of working with execs or, or senior leaders, um, is when you grab a cup of coffee and and just the words that come back to you, mm. or or you ask them to actually go away and and think about the work and then how it applies to what they do in their lives and then present it back and the words that they use, and so it's always fascinating to see what comes back, what comes back, and what you realise is that um, it has to be very simple, you know, and, and it has to be. Uh, sticky. It has to be memorable. And, and some things stick and some things don't. So um, I think it's always the challenge when you do a big piece of work um, is, you know, you, you, you sort of go for a drink with your friends or you hang out. And, and I'm not really um, friends with academics. That That's not really my social circle. I love academia and I love research, but, um, but they're not the people I hang out with. So um, they're always like, okay, this is great. I know you've done like, you know, 13 years of research, but what's the one thing I need to do differently? And and, and so you're sort of being forced to, to distill and condense it down, um, which can be frustrating. Yeah. Uh, but equally, uh, you start to realize that um, pe- ultimately for your ideas to spread, people have to like them and engage with them. Uh, but they also have to be able to tell them to other people. And so you have to give them names. Um, We did a piece of work uh, sort of that was running in parallel to this that was around um, failing schools and and how do you improve a failing school. And we were given access to 160 schools, which we then tracked for eight years. And there was just over 400 leaders of those schools. and we sort of tracked what they did, what they believed, and what the, ultimately the impact was, and uh, had to come up with a typology because you have to, and then had to give them names because it's the name that sticks. And you know, we had five- you're giving people a way of speaking about these issues. Yes, no, it makes yeah, complete yeah, sense. Yeah, really. Um, and so we came up with five names, and then. Uh, we got to present our work on Newsnight and they just picked three of the names. And then the articles that are written about our work picked two of the names. And then often when you talk to people, one of the names appears, you know. So so everyone's kind of reducing your work. And so you have to realise that that will happen. And Can I just ask you if if I'd said that to you, if I'd said only one of these five will really gain traction, would you have guessed the right one? Well, there were two that were very obvious. So um, so there are three that were really interesting. There were two that are very obvious. So, so we talked about the difference between architects who ultimately believe that a school fails because it doesn't serve its community. So they, they essentially redesign it and rebuild it. And they are in it for the long term. They're in it for 
for developing something that will serve future generations. They're building the cathedral in the parlance. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so there is an element of design. There is an element of permanence. Uh, and I must, you know, uh, th- these names. You know, I spent many sleepless nights waking up in the middle of the night, writing on bits of paper, falling back to sleep, you know, etc. And there were lots of names, which you then test out with different yeah. people. And you kind of, it takes several months to get the names, you realise. Um, and, and your point right at the beginning about how these things are emergent and you 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 can't tell yourself from the research which are the things that are going to land. You have to work it out in conversation when people see the relevance to their lives, their organisations. Yeah, completely. And um, uh, so so we compared surgeon, uh, architects with surgeons. So surgeons come in and cut. And, and what happens is they get an immediate impact. And worryingly, you know, in our study... 30% of them got knighted for their services for education, but the way they improve the school is they get rid of kids, basically, and you see it drop. So, but it's very precise and it's what they do, and they believe that it's the right thing for the school because the school does improve quickly and then they leave and they kind of ride off and help another school. So, I mean, very much like you get in business, actually. Right. Um, so, yeah. troubleshooters. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and they uh, are shocked, surprised when the schools fail after they leave, uh, you know, go back to where they were because nothing's changed. And what's fascinating is sometimes the school will even get them back again. Of course, because while you were here, it was great. Yeah. So, so uh, and then the most common leader we found uh, taught a good game but didn't do anything, and we called them philosophers. <laughs> so, so they were the three that kind of got picked up, but then the whole debate became architects versus surgeons, and I guess yeah. that kind of is obvious. Um, although I did, because uh, I've realized realized you do have to follow your work on Twitter to be aware of the conversations <laughs> that are happening. Altmetrics. Yeah, they haven't always been positive. Um, and I do. I did the other day. Someone said, "What was that thing about dentists?" So, so even then, you know, <laughs> rather than surgeons, rather than surgeons, they, so, so it not always gets. But what you, I think, what you realise, because I have had this experience, is people misinterpret your work, and um, and it's very easy to to get upset with them for doing that, but actually you sort of need to help them not in miss yes. your work. So um, so I think, you know, the centennials is a, is a challenge because uh, sometimes people think millennials, I'm stumbling over that one. Uh, so they think, you know, Generation Z. But actually, uh, it's much more common use is to describe something that's 100 years old or a yes. celebration of 100 years. So... Um, but again, you know, uh, it took a long time to find that word and you kind of, I think what you ideally, uh, hope for is that you introduce a word that does have meaning and a deeper meaning, but it's maybe not one that's fully understood. And then yeah. you give meaning to the word. Like a brownfield site to build on. Exactly. You know, I mean, I always think. It's like, you know, when you, I mean, we all do it. We all, we all um, take a lot of time to work out what to call our children. But ultimately, uh, the name becomes our child, that they're mm-hmm. inseparable. So, so actually, it doesn't matter in many ways long term what name we give them because the child brings the name meaning. Mm-hmm. And, and hopefully your work brings the meaning to the word. But... What you, what you want? I mean, it was it was lovely. I remember with the, with that work around schools. My brother, um, you know, called me one night and said well, I was out for dinner, and suddenly everyone started talking about architects and surgeons. So, you know, that's what you hope. You hope yeah. that your work, uh, your ideas spread. I, I, and you know, I guess you have to make a decision who you're writing for and who's your audience. But for me. I'm not really writing for academics. That that's not of interest to me. 
Um, I'm writing for people who are in the front line and who are running organizations or having to make difficult decisions. Uh, and they're very short of time and you need to give them sort of, you know, sort of nice parcels of ideas and, and words that they kind of stick to that they can then be talked about, hopefully, and spread. And the word carries the deeper concept, you hope, uh, along with it. You the do. thing that really struck me about Centennial, so you're, you're looking at um, organisations, not, not businesses in most cases, actually, but organisations with real longevity. And, and you're doing a kind of um, ground up uh, assessment of, of, of what are the elements of that and what can businesses learn from that. It, it's very um, redolent of uh, of Jim Collins and Good to Great and Built to Last and those sorts of things. So, uh, and you explicitly address the kind of the different ways that you can draw lessons from, uh, you know, from case studies, from from looking at performance, from data. I'd I'd love to just interrogate that a little bit because it's obviously very much in your mind as you were doing it, as as was Jim Collins. So tell us about the context in which you put all that together. Yeah, so um, I got halfway through my life. I hit forty. My my I followed in my dad's footsteps. So I spent the first ten years running companies. Uh, and then moved into academia, uh, and then have since always worked with companies as well as being an academic. So I'm from practice, and I and I spend most of my time still in practice. You know, I love the university, uh, but I see my role is to go out and find ideas and bring them back. So for me, and there's lots of different ways of doing research and lots of different academics, but for me, the ideas come from um, sort of absorbing myself in practice. So hanging out with people, watching, observing, seeing, thinking, and then the ideas come, and then and then you sort of extract yourself and try and make sense of what you found. So... Um, Whole cycle writ large, isn't it? Yeah, it is, but it, 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 it doesn't often start with a theory. It, it starts with practice, and, and that's different. Um... Which is very different from the academic sort of hypothesis and then you go and test it, which is a scientific method, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So, um, And I think it comes from the fact that I worked in practice first. So so my motivation always was to try and help the people that I'd kind of worked with that were my, <clears throat> my community, my tribe, whatever you want to say, uh, but realised that it's so full on <clears throat> when you work in a really high performing environment um because you know high performance is high stress it, that, that's the one thing that you realize whether it's the military you know it's surgery it's the arts it's sports or whatever um the one common thread is that the impact of your decisions matters so if you get it right it's significant if you get it wrong it's significant and that brings a level of stress with it so actually when you're working in that environment where time is often tight and you're having to make decisions and you're feeling stressed and your brain's doing weird things, uh, how do you make the right decisions and how do you make good decisions and how do you ultimately get better? Um, so my motivation really is to, to help people in those moments by helping them realise that actually uh, there's a pattern that those moments aren't just unique. Um, and there's a pattern through the moments they'll experience, but there's also a pattern in those moments in lots of different contexts and lots of different environments. So, um, so come from practice, went into academia, sort of basically learned how to, to research and write and teach, and then sort of went, okay, I'm halfway through, I've hit 40. Um, <clears throat> What do I want to leave behind? And my dad has always asked me those sorts of questions. You know, he's always said, uh, "What you remember what you leave behind is what you write. Okay, so that was something he said a lot. You know, you can teach and do have a really brilliant impact on people in the moment, but your impact is quite limited. You know, you can only teach so many people at once. Uh, and often it's in the moment and, and, and not all of it is retained or used, etc. So, um, whereas a, a book, and again, this is sort of where I'm slightly non-academic, uh, articles, I think, are short term. I think that they, they are great for stimulating ideas, but uh, 
No one talks about the article that changed their life. And they're not read for decades after they've been written. Uh, and they're not f as foundational in the same way as books are. Um, so um, what do you want to leave behind? And I realized that actually I love being around people who are performing to a high level. Mm. Uh, whether it's making a meal in a kitchen or whether it's performing sport or acting or music or science or medicine, whatever it is, uh, people who love performing at a really high level. And around that time, uh, so this, this is something I found is that as soon as you know the question you want to answer, the world helps you answer it. That's my experience. You I'm know. sure there's some good neurology behind that as well in terms of your, was it reticular activation system or whatever it is, you start noticing things and you start, because you're talking about it, people talk back to you and opportunities open up. Exactly. And it's the power of a good question, you realise. Yes. And, um, uh, and so I sort of started to, 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 a friend of mine at the time was working with the coaches of the Olympic teams and it was it was sort of mid cycle uh, before um, lo the London Games, so it's sort of around two thousand and ten ish. And he said, "There's something really interesting going on at UK Sport that funds the Olympic teams. Uh, shall we see if we can find out what it is?" And um, at this point, you're kind of grappling. I don't really know. I know that I'm interested in high performance. Uh, I don't really know what I'm interested in about it, but that environment seems interesting. Uh, the Olympics seem interesting because that's obviously, you know, pushing and, and trying to develop. And we we met a guy called Peter Keane. So Peter um, started the transformation of British cycling. He was the original uh, psychologist who worked with um, um, Chris Boardman and um, had got the original, spotted the, 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 the lottery money was coming, wrote the first business plan, sort of set cycling on its path. And then UK Sports said, look, could you come and replicate what you've done in cycling with our other teams? And he, incredibly thoughtful uh, person, uh, very nervous, very unassuming, um, the kind of person that everyone in UK sport knows, but the rest of the world doesn't know. You know, you sort of often find that in these incredible mm -hmm. organisations. The real person behind the organisation is very humble and actually just like the architects mm -hmm. in our school's work. Uh, was it one architect said to me once, you know, nobody should notice when I leave the room. And, and, and that, that sort of humility... But um, but anyway, P we had a day with Peter, and he just talked us through his, his entire journey, and um, he went to this huge whiteboard and, and wrote cult at one end, and then wrote sustainable system at the other end, and he just said too many of our sports are cults, they're too reliant on one or two individuals, and if they leave, what will happen? So I said, well, oh, that's so that moment schools businesses yeah to, yes and, and it was sort of oh that's interesting and yeah. then um and i said you know well what does keep you awake at night and he said well is it sustainable we've done some brilliant work and i said well who could you learn from and he's like the arts they've been doing it for hundreds of years and so that was the moment when it was like okay actually what i think would be really interesting is how do you create something that is sustainable yeah that doesn't just last for a long time, but but can perform at a high level for a long yes. time and can sort of revitalize, rejuvenate, et cetera, itself as you go along. So um, that really, I guess, was when, when it suddenly went, okay, that's interesting. And then I s then spoke to everyone I could think of who I respect, and I just said, who do you think has sustained their success for a long time and sort of gathered together all of those views people who who sort of work in this area um you know who's interesting who do you think we could learn from uh and then sort of distilled that down now the challenge was that no one said a business 
So, so that was, you know, interesting. Interesting in itself, yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually, it was, you know, the Royal Shakespeare. It was a company. It was, you know, the Olympic teams. It was NASA. It was the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team. It was, it was, uh, you know, Eton School. It was the sort of, you know, it was actually different areas. And then sort of said, well, why is that? And then started to dig deeper into to, to the research around business and then discovered that, that they are dying earlier and earlier. And so that was okay. So that's interesting. They are dying earlier and earlier. Often the ones that have been around for a long time aren't that inspirational. You know, they're sort of old, but maybe not. You don't think of them as being really mm-hmm. on the edge still. Um, but when you move into other environments and other sort of walks of life, you do get this sort of, you know, long, old and cutting edge. And, and that's interesting. So it was incredibly sort of, you know, you're stumbling from one thing to next. And um, I just guessed people's email addresses. So, you know, uh, this organization looks interesting. Uh who what might their email address be let's send it a few times until it stops bouncing i love that you know and then again the journalistic streak in you (laughs) and the power of the good question yes you know and and what was fascinating and you're engaged in something which is interesting to them why would they not want to talk to you about this yeah yeah and you know we had a pretty good hit rate to be honest i think there was one or two that said we're very busy um but like, you know, the All Blacks, the CEO responded in 15 minutes and went, this sounds interesting. Exactly. So, yeah. so that was that was a really, coming back to your point earlier, that, that power of that question and then suddenly people are engaging with you. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, oh, maybe I'm onto something here. And I'm, I'm so conscious of the time, but I, I want to sort of, I want to talk about writing as well, but I guess I'm going to do it with the question, knowing yeah. the power of the question. I mean, you, you have that interesting mix of academia and business expertise. You're writing with all that academic background, but you're writing very clearly for a business audience. What one tip would you give someone who is sitting down to write a business book, who's at the beginning of the journey that you've just finished? Um, so I think you do need to work out who you're writing for. I know that's pretty obvious, uh, but most academics write for academics. Mm-hmm. Um, And I'm not interested in that. I think they're sort of well served by other academics. And I think what they do is great. But I'm writing for people who are short of time, um, who generally, I think business people do read quite a lot of books. I remember a brilliant leader I once worked with, he just said, they're cheap ideas. He goes, it's 20 pounds. If I get one idea for 20 quid, that's great. So it's not just it's 20 quid isn't spend the, the spend is your time, isn't it? Your attention, isn't it? Those are much more scarce resources. Exactly. Yeah, very good point. Um so you're writing for people who are short of time, uh, who make quick judgments and who will judge your work quite quickly. Um and and I think often what what needs to be there is a framework that sits underneath that's incredibly robust. But but you never really show that off. You know, that kind of just sits underneath quietly. And then you have to ultimately find some really interesting stories. And yes. that's, that's a journey in itself. So I think most academics find an idea and publish it and think, okay, it's done now, I'll move on to the next thing. If you want to write for practice, business, whatever, uh, that's step one. And then the question is, okay, how do I write for my audience? And that's a whole other journey. I mean, I think the ideas in the book, it took probably three to four years to then bring them to life. You know, so... so I, I think you could almost call those steps the sort of the, the ta-da and the so what, couldn't you? The, <laughs> the ta-da is a sort of necessary but not a sufficient condition for someone to actually be able to use it in practice. Yeah, and I guess for me as an academic... I'm always, I'm always trying to rip apart my stories. So you, you're telling a story that that you hope is interesting, and again, you find out pretty quickly when you try and tell that story verbally to someone else, you know, whether mm. it's interesting or not. 
uh, and friends are great for that because you know they'll tell you they'll tell you and you'll lose them super fast if it's not uh or you'll stumble over it as yeah. you try to tell it it becomes confusing so you realize mm-hmm. um and then but then what i always wanted to go okay well what is the neuroscience beneath that or what is the yeah. psychology beneath that or what is the can i find a data set of thousands that actually explains that. It's not that. just anecdotal. Yeah, and then you sort of move between the two because the story, I think you have to be able to understand and explain the story so it makes sense. But then you jump to the bigger thousands sample that sits beneath and say, what is really going on here? Yeah. What is happening? And then you jump back to the story with that new knowledge and rewrite it. But, but each chapter was a process of finding probably four or five key stories. And then you're looking for patterns between them. And, and often it is the failures that shine the light on the success. You know, it's the absence of something that is more compelling. And I think to when you tell those stories to others, the failures are often what convinces them a lot more than the success. Yeah. So, the negative uh, data. Yeah, completely. And also it's the feeling of, you know, human nature that that ultimately we are trying to protect our children, avoid risks, stop, stop bad things happening. So I think you become more alert when you think, oh, maybe this could all go wrong. Yeah, um, brilliant. I also always ask my guests, as you know, and I know you've been dreading this, <laughs> to recommend a book that they think everybody should read. Now, you're not allowed to recommend Centennials, obviously. <laughs> what... What would you recommend to listeners? So, yeah, I don't know the answer to this. I I think, can I answer, can I give two answers? Only if you do it briefly. (laughs) So I think, so, so first answer is a book that's full of brilliant ideas. That's incredibly ambitious, which I think every book should be is why nations fail. Uh, And I, and I, I love it for its ambition. And I think that you're wrestling with a really big, interesting question. And the ideas are relevant to anything, failing or not failing. Um, It could be shorter, it could be simpler, it could be more engaging, but it's brilliant. Um, And then I think um, the second book is, how do you make your books engaging? And I once remember a physicist saying to me that every academic should read Harry Potter regularly. (laughs) And I think there's a lot of truth in that. And as I've written, as I've been writing, I only read simple books. Now, because I have younger children, I don't know how many times I've read Harry Potter or heard Stephen Fry read it to me. But there's a lot of simplicity. You know, you, you, when you talk to children, you realise they work in black and white, right, wrong, mm-hmm. Bad, fast, slow, etc. And Harry Potter is like that. It's very simplistic. Um, coming back to names, every name is thoughtfully considered to present an idea. You know the characters. And I think that the thing I found most useful when I'm writing is to read really simple books that ultimately have sold millions because they are simplistic. They're, mm. they're but their ideas are still very core and fundamental and transcend to all different environments and situations. So um, I always read simple books when I'm writing and hope that it sort of translates into my writing. I love that. And that point, actually, going right back to the beginning and, and you know, the idea of coining a word, <clears throat> excuse me, coining a word that people can use. J.K. Rowling is amazing at that, isn't she? That's that's one of the reasons that there's those, that not just the names, but the the, the, the spell words, the the the, the, um, the 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 words she coins for the for the apparatus of the Wizarding World is that they're just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, she's created a whole world that yeah. you know. You watch something like, um, you know, sort of the the the, the later ones. Uh, God, my mind could slip my mind completely. Um, the, the ones with uh, Eddie Redman in, you know. Oh yes, what, fantastic creatures and where to find them and that kind of thing. Yeah. And what 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 you notice as soon as you start watching that film is you just slip into a world that you yes. know. Yes, and it's completely consistent. You totally believe in it. Yeah. yeah. 
doesn't have to be explained because I know it all immediately. And so I think, again, if you want your ideas to spread, then you almost have to help the reader do that. Yeah, and to enter your world. Yeah, completely. Yeah, brilliant. Great recommendations. Genuinely, in how many years has this podcast been going now? Six, seven years? The first time anybody's ever recommended Harry Potter. And I can't believe it's taken this long. <laughs> Alex, it was fantastic to talk to you. Thank you so much. If people want to find out more about you, more about Centennials and the work that you do, where should they go? So I have a website, which is professoralexhill.com. And that's a good place to go. That's got sort of like the big projects that we've been working on. Um, and then we also have a website called radicallytraditional.org, which is very specifically around the sort of how do you sustain success. And that has sort of tips and sort of models and self-assessments and things you can use there too. Fantastic. Well, I'll put both those links up on the show notes at extraordinarybusinessbooks.com. As always, thank you so much for your time today. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Real pleasure.